I think most of us are aware of the fact that most of our planet's surface is covered in water, about 70%. According to NASA, 99% of the habitable space on this planet is in the ocean. Sunlight in the ocean decreases with depth, and depths below 1,000 meters don't receive any light from the surface. The average depth of the ocean, however, is 3,688 meters, about 12,000 feet. This is known as the aphotic zone. Now, facts like these can be quite unsettling to many people. You may have heard of thalassophobia, coming from the Greek word thalassa for sea and phobos for fear. Though this fear can relate to any large body of water really, ocean, sea or lake. Thalassophobia isn't really the fear of the water itself, that would be aquaphobia. Thalassophobia, rather, is about how bodies of water can seem fast, dark, deep, and dangerous. As it says on Very Well Mind, people are not afraid of the water so much as they are afraid of what lurks beneath its surface. Natural environment type phobias tend to be reasonably common, but getting an exact number on thalassophobia is difficult. Though it seems to be a popular topic. I mean, the Reddit page is nearly a million members strong. Of course it would be foolish to assume that all the members on the page had the full phobia, but the interest is there. Perhaps we can also gauge interest by how many lists of dangerous sea monsters pop up and become very popular. Top 10 terrifying sea creature sightings. 10 terrifying deadly ocean monsters. 10 deadliest river animals. Top 10 real sea monsters. 10 most dangerous creatures in the ocean. You get the picture. 10 dangerous, terrifying, deadly, lethal, etc, etc. And bonus points if you put the Mariana Trench or Megalodon in the title, for some reason. Now, the popularity of these videos would make me think that many people enjoy them, and that's great. But if you are planning on making one of these lists, make sure you don't put any dodgy information into it, or you might get roasted by a fish biologist. Great channel, by the way. Why do these topics always appear in top 10 or whatever number lists? Well, there are a variety of reasons. Oh, you know what might be fun? What if I did the top 10 reasons why top 10 lists are, oh, it's already been done a thousand times. I guess it's fun and easy to process information. We can skim through it fast. We enjoy guessing what's up next while the anticipation builds for the top spot. And there are probably some other reasons too. Lists just make good YouTube videos, or at least they can, or at least they can be popular. So much so that entire channels have been built around this idea. Now I've watched a bunch of videos and read articles online with these water monster lists, but this isn't exactly a react video. I mean, not only has that been done and done well, but also, I want to look at this a little differently. I want to look at these monsters and see why they are monsters. Why do some animals keep coming up on these lists? Now, you may have noticed from the title I didn't write specifically ocean, lake, or river monsters, and that's because I want to try and roll it all into one video. Now, some of you might be wondering, but you have top five. How can you fit everything into five slots? Well, I'm actually not doing five animals. I'm going to do five different categories with a bunch of creatures in each category. Now, before we start, make sure to hit like and subscribe, or don't, I guess. When I think of the word monster, I usually imagine a creature that is dangerous to humans. The word itself apparently comes from the Latin monstrum, and that word comes from another word, moneo, to remind, warn, instruct, or foretell. I guess if something seems a bit strange, it could be seen as a kind of a warning, kind of. But really, these are the creatures that keep popping up on lists that don't feel like they should. Take for example, the giant isopod. This one comes up a lot. I guess it has the right look to freak people out as it sort of looks like a giant bug. And they are related to the common woodlouse, or pill bug, or roly poly, or whatever you want to call them, which itself isn't even an insect. The first thing I'd say in response though, is that it's pretty unlikely you'll ever get to see one of these. Now I say giant isopod as if it's one species, but according to a paper by James K. Lowry and Kate Dempsey for the Australian Museum, that could actually refer to about 18 different species in the genus Pathonomus. About half of the species are considered giants, which is up to 150 millimeters in length, and the others are supergiants, which is up to 500 millimeters in length. The thing is though, most of these giants and supergiants live very deep down, we're talking about 170 meters to over 2,000 meters. Unless you're James Cameron, I don't think you'll be going that deep. 
to be fair, in some parts of the world, some species, specifically Pathanomus miare, was spotted at a much shallower depth, about 20 meters. So perhaps if you are in a specific location at the right time and are scuba diving, you might see one. But otherwise, you'd probably have to go to an aquarium. Speaking of, there is an aquarium in Florida with a tank where you can touch a giant isopod, which right away makes me think they're probably pretty harmless. I've even seen a YouTube video where a guy was handling one for multiple minutes and even put it right up to his arm to see if it would bite. It didn't. These animals are harmless. It's a classic example of something being called a monster because it looks a bit strange or off. A bit like the blobfish. For some reason, probably the reason I literally just said, this fish ends up on real sea monster lists too. It seems it received a lot of fame in 2013 when it was voted the ugliest animal in the world by the Ugly Animal Preservation Society. Bit harsh, especially since most images of this fish show it out of water on the surface when it normally lives 600 to 1200 meters deep in an incredibly high pressure environment. When it's in its normal habitat, it looks just kind of like a normal fish. They only grow to about 30 centimeters and are very rare. Most aquariums don't even have them. I think an aquarium in Fukushima, Japan got one in 2017, but I don't know if it's still there. Again, I don't really see how they can pose any threat to a human at all. They're just not very photogenic under certain conditions. Similarly, anglerfish have a tendency to be put on these lists. At least anglerfish have a sinister look since they have very large teeth and of course the bioluminescent esca, which is what that thing is called, that may help them to attract prey when hunting, as well as some other things. I guess monster is a relative term, as Dr. Wu would tell us. If you're a small squid that might get lured by this fish, I guess you could call it a monster, but I'm going to guess that you're probably not a small squid. Now again, though list will just say the anglerfish, there are actually hundreds of species of anglerfish. Perhaps people are referring to the five species in the genus Meloncetus, sometimes called devilfish. There's Melancetus johnsoni that lives between 100 and 1500 meters down. There's Melancetus rosy that lives over 390 meters down. Melancetus eustilis lives off the Pacific coast of Mexico at depths of over 1600 meters. Melancetus niger that lives 1200 to 2000 meters down. Melancetus murai, which lives over 2000 meters down. I think you can see what I'm getting at here. These fish live so deep down that you can't really even get to them. And even if you could, they're all pretty small. There are some bigger anglerfish, of course. If we look at the family Ceratidae, also known as sea devils, there is a species called Croyer's deep sea anglerfish. This is usually considered to be the biggest species of anglerfish, with females able to grow to about 120 centimeters long, though males only get to about 16 centimeters. But again, this fish is usually found at around 400 to 2000 meters deep. And on the site fish base, under threat to humans, they are listed as harmless. While we are on the topic of deep sea fish with big teeth, let's talk about a couple of sharks. The goblin shark and the frilled shark. Later in the video, other sharks will show up. But for now, let's just take a look at these two, or I guess three. Now, according to the international shark attack file, almost any shark in the right size range, roughly six feet, 1.8 meters, or greater, is a potential threat to humans. Now for the Southern African frilled shark, females can grow to approximately 117 centimeters. So it's a bit under the range. For the regular frilled shark, it can grow to about two meters or 6.6 .6 feet. And goblin sharks can get surprisingly big with adults getting up to three and four meters in length. And there are even reports of ones getting up to about five or even six meters in length. So if they meet this size threshold for potentially dangerous, shouldn't they be on another part of this list? Well, maybe they should. And maybe this video is more of a Venn diagram than a list. But I've decided to put them here because they show up on so many lists and they haven't hurt anyone. If we look at the ISAF again, which is quote, the world's only scientifically documented comprehensive database of all known shark attacks, and covers a period from the early 1500s to the present, we see there is no record of these sharks hurting anyone. They are rare deep sea sharks, so it'd be pretty difficult for someone to even find one. Let's face it, the reason they get put on these lists isn't because they are dangerous, it's because they look weird. I mean, personally, I think they look pretty cool, especially the frilled shark. I like how it looks like it's smiling as it's swimming along. I want to move on to the next category, but before I do, let's look at one more weird sea monster. 
the Mola Mola, or ocean sunfish. While it's a big creature, articles and videos will love telling you how it's one of the heaviest bony fish in the world, the other being the southern sunfish, Mola alexandrini. But is it any threat to humans? Not so much. They are pretty docile animals with relatively small mouths, which they can't even close fully. But again, they are heavy, so if one lands on you, it could injure you. Has this happened? Well, according to a BBC News story from 2004, this has happened to a young boy when he was out on a boat with his family off the coast of Wales. The fish jumped out of the water and landed on the boy on the boat. Luckily, the boy got away with some cuts and bruises and his dad threw the fish back into the sea. The same article does say that a man was once killed by this fish, again by it landing on top of him. That's really unfortunate, but it's really just sort of a freak accident. The only other way this fish can hurt you, apart from accidentally landing on you, is if you eat it. Products derived from sunfish are banned in the EU as they contain toxins that might be harmful to humans. Though it is considered a delicacy in places like Taiwan and Japan, so who knows. Why should anyone worry about a creature that's extinct? Well, what if it's not extinct? It probably is. But these creatures seem to sneak onto these lists. The what-if animals from millions of years ago. It also makes for an eye-catching thumbnail if you put a large extinct predator next to a human. Not that I would ever, ever, ever use a thumbnail like that. But in my defense, I usually make it clear in the actual video that I think the creature is extinct. Sometimes that's the point of the entire video. Now, there are some usual suspects. Megalodon, of course, gets a bunch of its own top 10 lists, filled with images of basking sharks and Pacific sleeper sharks and misdated Meg teeth and intercut with images from The Meg the Movie and stock footage with CGI sharks. Same stock footage I use in my videos. The difference is, I use it for the truth. Just kidding. But it's not just the Meg. Other, older creatures pop up in these videos too. What if a plesiosaur or pliosaur or mosasaur still lurks in the depths of the ocean? Well, if they didn't go extinct millions of years ago, they did. But if they didn't, I think someone would have noticed them. For one, they are all marine reptiles, so they'd need to keep coming to the surface to breathe. And for another, big predators like this will need to eat a bunch of food, so they need to be around a bunch of other large marine life. Yet no diver or marine biologist or fisherman or sailor or beachgoer has ever seen one. But wait, have I even considered the coelacanth? The first time I ever heard about the coelacanth, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, was through the lens of cryptozoology. And almost every single time I've heard of it mentioned since then was also through cryptozoology. You probably already know the script. Oh, you think this creature is extinct? Well, the scientists used to say the coelacanth went extinct 65 million years ago, until one was caught by a fishing trawler off the coast of South Africa in 1938. And it is a fascinating and great discovery, but it seems like that it's held up as evidence for any extinct animal to still exist. Oh, maybe sauropods live in the Congo. But didn't sauropods go extinct millions of years ago? Silicanth. Maybe there are some mammoths in Siberia. Don't think so? Oh well, maybe you should think about the coelacanth, buddy. What about a predatory shark the size of a bus that had to eat thousands of kilos a day that lived in the open ocean and around coasts all over the world? You might think it's extinct, since we have no evidence of it being alive and all of its fossils are millions of years old, but that's what they thought about the coelacanth. I think you get the picture. You think this animal is extinct? Well, you're wrong because of the coelacanth. Now I don't mean to bash on cryptozoology. I honestly find it a fascinating subject, but I just don't think the coelacanth is good evidence for all of these other extinct animals. This living fossil, well, it's not really a living fossil, but anyway, the two extant members of this species, found off the east coast of Africa and Indonesia, spend most of their days in underwater caves. Though 1938 might be relatively recent by some metrics, a lot of technology has progressed since then. The coelacanth was discovered 16 years before we even had the first full-length underwater documentary in colour. If we found a rare fish that spends most of its time hiding in caves back in the 30s, you think by now we would have found a large predatory animal that would be moving around and hunting. It's kind of a shame that the coelacanth is generally only talked about to prove something else might not be extinct. I mean, it's an interesting fish on its own. And 
Ironically and tragically, this animal that's used as proof that certain creatures aren't extinct might actually go extinct in the future. The Indonesian coelacanth is listed as vulnerable, with a few thousand left, and the West Indian Ocean coelacanth is considered critically endangered, with only a few hundred left. But people don't mention that part so much. Speaking of cryptozoology, uh, sort of, lists of water monsters will often include cryptids. Of course, extinct animals thought to still be alive are considered cryptids, but there are also these other like sea serpents and lake and river monsters that don't seem to resemble any other known creature, living or extinct. But of course there is some overlap with some of these monsters. But even if you do believe in these creatures, most accounts just seem to be a sighting where the creature doesn't harm anyone. Oh yeah? Tell that to the boys who were attacked and killed by a sea monster off the coast of Florida in 1962. Well, that is a topic that is difficult to find direct sources for, and talking about these kind of serpents is a topic that is so dense, you could probably make a bunch of YouTube videos just about actually. But for the purposes of this video, I don't think you need to worry about being attacked by a creature that may or may not be real. But wait. 90% of the ocean is unexplored. Who knows what could be lurking at the depths of- Well, I've already covered this before, so let's try and do it very quickly. Okay, so our oceans are gigantic, and we've mapped about 20% of them. And by that I mean 20% of the seafloor has been mapped at high resolution. And teams are working to get that number up to 100% within the next 10 years. But what about ocean life specifically? Well, to support life, you need to have an underwater ecosystem. And you have to have a food web with a strong foundation to build upon. For the ocean, the slowest level consists of phytoplankton. These are very small plants that convert carbon dioxide to organic carbon. The cool thing is, the green chlorophyll from these plants is visible from space and can be mapped by satellites. Scientists can use these images to estimate the productivity of ocean life. And the thing is, large areas of the open ocean are known as biological deserts. Some even call them dead zones. The most remote point of the ocean, sometimes called Point Nemo, is in one of these deserts where there is still some but less life. Most of ocean life can be found in coastal regions on the continental shelf and they only account for about 7% of the total ocean area. Now you could make an entire video about how much of the ocean is unexplored, and in fact, people have. Around the same time I released the response to Megalodon evidence video, a marine biologist and YouTuber, C and Me, released a video talking specifically about this topic, and talked about what explored actually meant relative to the ocean, and all the different methods that scientists use. Considering this is such a hot topic, I'm surprised that the video hasn't gotten more views. It definitely deserves it, and I highly recommend you watch it. I specifically like this part. It's very, very unlikely that the Megalodon still exists. Okay, now I'm sure people will still tell me about the coelacanth and unexplored ocean in the comments, but let's move on. Next, let's look at some animals that pop up on these lists that maybe could cause some harm, or might have, but usually don't. We've mostly looked at ocean animals so far, so let's switch things up a bit and look at some animals from rivers and lakes. Sometimes animals end up on these lists, not for being creepy, but for being kind of big. Enter the giant otter. But don't let their cute and furry appearance fool you. Or something like that, I don't know. Now the reasons given for this animal being a monster is that, well, for one, they are big. These otters can grow to 1.7 meters in length and possibly even more than that. It seems like they were even bigger in the past, before they were hunted. And they can weigh somewhere in between 26 to 32 kilos. The second reason given for why they are deadly, terrifying river monsters is that they will hunt black caiman and anacondas. Is that true? Well, research was published for the scientific paper Biotropica titled Feeding Ecology of Giant Otter. The people of the study collected fecal samples year-round and found that the otters mostly eat fish. It would seem that otters eat small anacondas and small caimans sometimes, but that's usually if fish are scarce. Though I've also seen videos of a family of otters attacking a big caiman to defend their territory. So are they dangerous to humans? Well, in general, otters have attacked humans, but it's not very common. There's a paper from 2011 called A Review of Violent or Fatal Otter Attacks. The paper looked at, quote, evidence of otter attacks on humans for any geographical and temporal relationship from the earliest 1875 to the most recent December 2010. Now of course there have been some otter attacks since 2010. A man was attacked by 20 otters in Singapore in 2021 and there are a few other accounts in the last decade. 
But let's go back to the paper since it covers a wide span of time. Of the 39 attacks recorded from 1875 to 2010, none were from South America, where the giant otters live. They were pretty much all from British Columbia and America, with most occurring in Florida. So are there any recorded accounts of giant otters attacking people? Well, yes. A two-year-old child was bitten in a Texas aquarium and an 18-month-old boy had his arm scratched at the same aquarium by a giant otter. The children were injured, but I don't think it was too serious. I don't know if we should count attacks from captivity though. Like, orca have killed people in captivity, but never in the wild. So are these otters dangerous? I think it's conceivable that if a family of giant otters felt threatened by someone in their territory, they might attack them. But given that these animals are rare, in fact they are endangered, and there aren't many verified accounts, I say it's not very likely to happen. The green anaconda will show up on a lot of river monster lists, and it seems that in the media it is considered to be a bit of a monster. It even has its own movie series. Is it actually dangerous to humans? Well, as the subtitle suggests, potentially. They are very large snakes, although their size is subject to exaggeration, but they are generally considered to be the heaviest and one of the longest. Considering some of the big ones prey on mammals like deer and tapirs, it would seem conceivable that they might go for a human, particularly a small child. Have there been reports of this? Sure. Have they been verified? As far as I know, no. There aren't any verified reports of green anacondas killing people, at least not in the Amazon. In general, they seem to prefer to flee from humans rather than fight them, and interactions between humans and these snakes seem rare. A few years ago, a conservationist named Paul Rosalie tried to get a green anaconda to swallow him for a Discovery Channel show. He wore sort of body armor to try and help him when the snake would start constricting, and then he was covered in pig's blood, hoping to entice the snake to swallow him. They found a big female anaconda, and at first it just tried to flee from Paul, and he had to keep provoking it for it to attack. And it did. It constricted around him, and eventually tried to swallow him a bit. I think the top of his head was in the anaconda's mouth for a bit, but the snake was beginning to break Paul's arm, so the team pulled the snake off him. Both Paul and the anaconda were fine. Now you might be wondering, as I was, why did Paul do this? He talked about it in an interview, and apparently he did it because he knew the stunt would get a lot of publicity, and I guess he wanted to use this as an opportunity to talk about rainforest conservation. So I guess it was sort of a noble cause, but it's still a bit weird. But yeah, it seems perfectly possible for a green anaconda to kill a human, especially if the humans start provoking it. But accounts of this are based on rumors, so it's difficult to say how often it happens, or if it has happened. And that's sort of the same story with other river monsters. While we're still in South America, we might as well address the piranha, specifically the red-bellied piranha, another creature that has an entire series of horror films dedicated to it. Though the idea of piranhas as ferocious killers can probably be traced back to Theodore Roosevelt. You might have heard this story, it's from the book Through the Brazilian Wilderness, in which Roosevelt recounts his tales to the Amazon with his son Kermit. The book is now in the public domain, so I think you can read it for free online if you're curious. But the infamous story about the piranha is when some locals decided to put on a show for Roosevelt. So a few days before he arrives, they captured a bunch of piranhas from the river and kept them in like an aquarium and didn't feed them until Roosevelt arrived. When he did, they lowered a cow into the piranha tank and when it came back out, all that was left was the skeleton. This is probably what led him to describing them as the embodiment of evil ferocity, among other things. But are they lethal to humans? Well, if you're watching a video like this, I'm going to guess you probably have already seen the video of Jeremy Wade basically taking a bath with a bunch of red-bellied piranhas and coming out completely fine. Generally they seem to be pretty docile, but they have attacked some humans. They have been known to bite fishermen as they get pulled out of nets, but they usually steer clear of swimmers. There was a rare case in Argentina in 2017 where 70 bathers were bitten, but thankfully everyone lived. Wait, actually it was in 2013? And it wasn't the piranha, but the palmetta? Wait, no, the palmetta is an ocean going fish. Didn't this happen in a river? Okay, so apparently the attack was from a type of piranha. It's just the term palmetta is a general common name that gets used for species of sarasalmids. Piranhas are a type of sarasalmid. Confusing. 
Though it would seem that piranha generally don't try to attack people, and cases like the one in Argentina happen when there are some irregular conditions. For example, a big shift in temperature, low water levels, and a scarcity of food will make a piranha more likely to attack. They also might attack if they are defending their eggs. But most swimmers don't get attacked by piranhas. But have they killed people? Possibly. There are records of deaths that involve piranha bites, but a lot of the time it seems the cause of death was drowning and then the piranhas took bites out of the dead person. Again, there are a lot of stories and rumors that are difficult to verify for certain. We've looked at a bunch of South American water monsters. Let's go across the ocean and look at the Congo River Basin and talk about the Goliath tigerfish, sometimes referred to as a giant piranha, though they are in different families. I have to admit, many of the pictures of the Goliath tigerfish certainly make it look kind of like a monster. They have large prominent teeth that get to about two and a half centimeters. And as their name suggests, they can get pretty big about a meter and a half in length and weigh about 50 kilos and perhaps they can even get up to 70 kilos. They really have the look of something you'd fight in a video game in an underwater level. It's difficult to say how dangerous they are to humans as there aren't many official reports of attacks but they are considered dangerous by the locals. Their local Swahili name is Menga, which means dangerous fish. Considering the size and the mouthful of teeth, I think it's easy to see how it could inflict damage, though I'm not sure how often this happens. They are also found in areas that are home to crocodiles and hippos. They will come up later on the list, but needless to say, you probably shouldn't swim in these areas if there are crocodiles and hippos, regardless of how dangerous the tiger fish is. It seems that more research is needed on this fish. However, I just wanted to mention something strange that I stumbled upon. While trying to research facts about the Goliath tigerfish, I came across websites that give tips about keeping them as pets. People keep these fish as pets in home aquariums. I find that pretty shocking. I mean, one of the top tips is just don't do it, as they need a big tank. 10 to 15,000 liters, and they are illegal to own in some parts of the world, such as Florida. They also recommend not putting any other fish in the tank with them because they will probably eat them. In the wild, its only natural predator is a crocodile, and according to some stories, they will even start fights with them. But yeah, some people, I guess supervillains, keep them in home aquariums. I mean, they are a very cool looking fish, but what a commitment, especially since they can live up to 15 years. Next, let's go to India and Nepal, to an infamous river monster. Monster, the Goonch Catfish. I think this fish got its monster status due to the Kali River attacks. These were three attacks that happened between 98 and 2007. Two men and a boy were killed in separate attacks during these years in three separate villages along the Kali River. In 2008, an episode of River Monsters was dedicated to the Kali River monster and Jeremy Wade attempted to capture the goonch that had been attacking people. He did capture a fairly big goonch, but he thought a bigger one was needed for the attacks. Now, you might be wondering how they know it was definitely a goonch and not something else. Well, I guess you can't be 100% certain, but it doesn't seem like it was another animal. The area where the attacks occurred seemed too far inland for a saltwater crocodile, too cold for a mugger crocodile. Gariel apparently don't have the right kind of jaw structure for the attacks. Some initially thought it could have been a bull shark, but Jeremy Wade thought it was too far inland for a bull shark and that people would have noticed the dorsal fin breaking the surface. It seems like a big goonch is capable of killing people, Again, not very common, but potentially dangerous. Despite its potential danger though, in some parts of India, the goonch has a large cultural impact and is worshipped by some communities. Okay, let's go back to the ocean and look at the barracuda. Even though according to Jaws, no one knows what this fish is, it shows up surprisingly high on real life sea monster lists. Now the barracuda, genus Cifrina, actually contains 29 species. Usually these lists are talking about the Great Barracuda, probably because it has a wide range living in temperate waters in parts of India, the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, and also because they are one of the largest in its genus. Though apparently the largest barracuda ever caught was the Ghanaian Barracuda, Cifrina afra, caught in 2013. It weighed 46 kilos. According to the Florida Museum, the record for a caught great barracuda is 1.7 meters long and 44 kilos. But there are reports that it can grow over two meters and maybe more. Regardless of which is larger, is the great barracuda dangerous to humans? Well, there is a website for scuba divers called Scuba Diver Life, and they made a list of common myths about the barracuda. And the very first thing listed as a myth is they are dangerous to humans. Have there been attacks? Yes, but according to the site, only 25 in the last century. 
and it's thought that divers provoked the barracudas in most of the attacks. Also, most attacks involve spear fishing, and it seems the barracuda were trying to get to the fish, not the humans. According to the Florida Museum, there was a fatality in 1947 off Key West, and another off North Carolina in 1957. But again, this website says that attacks are rare, and it's usually a barracuda trying to take a fish from a spear fisherman. There are some accounts of barracuda being attracted to jewelry, mistaking the reflective flash for a fish, but this is also listed as a myth on the aforementioned website as apparently there is only one record of this happening, and it happened in murky water. For something that attacks so rarely, it's weird that the fish gets placed so high on lists. I guess it's more interesting to portray the fish as a monster than an animal that is very rarely dangerous. I guess if the real thing don't do the trick, you gotta m Also, if you're curious what the third myth is, it's that barracuda are poisonous. There is a risk of ciguatera poisoning, a certain plankton that produce the poison get eaten by the bigger fish, and I guess it gets passed on. So if you eat one, there is a chance you might become sick. Speaking of ciguatera, weird segue, but whatever, just go with it. But apparently this is also something you should be wary of if you eat moray eels. Moray eels? Aren't they the super aggressive creatures with the xenomorph extra set of jaws? Well, like a bunch of other animals on this list, there are actually many different species. There are over 200 species of moray eels, and while some certainly can be aggressive if threatened, and they can bite, they usually flee from people. Many bites happen from people who try to hand feed the eels. So if you keep your distance, you should be fine. They are also more active at night, so if you're swimming during the day, you can reduce your chances of seeing one, if you are very concerned about it. Again, there are multiple species, about 14 I think. Like some moray eels, they can get pretty big. In fact, the European conger is considered the largest type of eel in the world. If you look up conger eel attacks, you'll probably get an account of a man who was attacked off the west coast of Ireland by a big conger. The eel took a chunk out of his face and shook him around before swimming away. The diver, impressively, was able to remain calm and slowly went back to the surface and went to the hospital. I'm not going to show the picture of the bite here as it's a bit graphic. I mean, you can look it up if you're curious. With plastic surgery, the diver was set to heal pretty nicely. It seems like he wasn't seriously injured. Wait a second, how do we talk about South American river monsters and not talk about the electric eel? Now, whenever it shows up on lists, you always have to mention, despite its name, it's not actually an eel, but a knife fish. And you've probably heard it can generate 600 volts and that they are air breathers. There are currently three different species that reside in South America, and they are a very cool fish. Not only can they use their electric abilities for defense, but also to stun their prey. Not only that, but according to some studies, they can sort of remotely control fish, making them jump out of hiding spots if they sense them around. And that's the other thing. They are electrogenic, so they're able to give a shock, but they are also electric receptive and can sense other living things around them. And since they have poor eyesight, they use their electricity like a radar, and they can even use it to make sounds to court a mate. Most sources say they have killed people, though, like most animals in this section, it's very rare. But yes, multiple shocks can hurt and paralyze people, causing them to drown or go into cardiac arrest. Next, we'll look at some cephalopods. Now, when it comes to giant and colossal squid, I already made a video about squid attacks. But if you don't want to watch that video, the basic gist is that it's kind of ambiguous if those squid were trying to attack the people. There definitely are reports of big squid grabbing onto ships. Hard to say if it's definitely the giant squid or colossal squid. But since giant squid are more widespread, I usually go with them. The thing is, they are deep sea animals. So if they are at the surface, they are usually sick and or dying. They have capsized smaller boats but even then the danger seems to be from drowning as the squid don't bother with people when they fall in the water. There are a few YouTube videos with people interacting with giant squid too. One with a surfer and another where a guy swims with a giant squid in Toyama Bay, Japan. In both cases, the people were fine. Now, they were juveniles, but they don't seem very aggressive. Of course, you could probably say that an adult could conceivably grab someone and then drag them under, drowning them. But these deep sea giants are very rare. Even though we've known about them for over 100 years, images of living ones have only been captured in the last 20 years, and colossal squid are 
are even more rare. Oh, uh, but what about Humboldt squid? Well, there are varying accounts. Some divers report that they are usually not aggressive unless provoked, or they are hunting, but they have attacked people, causing them to nearly drown, and there are reports that they may have drowned people. They usually live at 200 to 700 meters deep, but will come closer to the surface at night. So it seems like you'd really have to go looking for them to ever encounter one. What about octopuses? Well, there is the blue ringed octopus, but we will talk about that in the venomous section. Let's look at something bigger. The giant Pacific octopus is the largest known octopus, and it inhabits the northern Pacific. The largest specimen ever recorded was over 600 pounds, with an arm span over 30 feet. There are some videos of giant octopus attacks, if you want to call them that. One where it grabs the camera of a diver and holds on until the diver pushes it off. Apparently a woman in an aquarium in Washington placed a baby one on her face and it bit her and she was injected with venom. She went to the hospital and got antibiotics and was fine, though it's thought this bite was more out of fear than an attack, as giant Pacific octopus seem to be rather shy. We can see this throughout history. There used to be a sport in the Pacific Pacific Northwest in the 50s and 60s called octopus wrestling. Even though it was called wrestling, the divers didn't wrestle with the octopuses per se, but instead they would try and grab them and pull them onto shore, I guess the goal being to be the biggest one. If giant Pacific octopus were truly aggressive lethal sea monsters, you'd think this would have ended badly. A disclaimer, I guess, is that if one grabbed onto someone's breathing apparatus or something, it could be pretty dangerous. But as it states on American Ocean, while they have the ability to inflict harm on humans if they wanted to, no attacks thus far have been fatal or even harmful. Let's move on to the next category, and since we already mentioned it, let's talk about the blue ringed octopus. I didn't realize before making this video that apparently all octopuses have venom. Though octopus venom is generally not dangerous to humans, blue ringed octopus venom definitely is. They can be found in tropical tide pools and coral reefs in the Indo-Pacific, from southern Japan to the coastal reefs of Australia. Currently there are four known species, but there may be more. Luckily they are usually pretty shy and prefer to flee rather than fight, but if they do bite, the venom could kill a person in a matter of minutes. No anti-venom currently exists. If a person is bitten, they should contact emergency services right away and try to stay as still as possible. According to WebMD, you should also apply a wide elastic bandage to the bitten area, bandage the entire limb, wrap it as tightly as you would a sprained ankle, and apply a rigid splint, and someone may need to perform CPR. The venom has many effects, but the main problem is that it shuts down the respiratory system. So if a person can get to a hospital in time and get on artificial respiration, they should be able to survive. One thing that freaks me out is that you might not even feel it bite you and you might not know you're in danger right away. Now all that sounds pretty scary, and it is, but the good news is that they aren't very aggressive animals, and deaths from blue ringed octopus bites are rare. There are only about three recorded fatalities ever, and they only really bite when they're being handled, so don't handle them. Just leave them alone and don't get too close. They also recommend, and by they I mean WebMD and Divers Alert Network, that if you are in an area that blue ringed octopus are known to inhabit, that you shouldn't stick your arm in crevices you can't see. I mean, I feel like like you shouldn't do that anyway, but there you go. Also, be wary of picking up cans or bottles or things they could hide in. I don't know if you should say this animal is a monster since it isn't an aggressive creature, but I guess it's capable of monstrous things if you touch one. In sort of the same vein, let's take a quick look at sea snakes. This is one animal on the list I've actually gotten to swim with in real life. While taking a holiday in Okinawa, I went on a snorkeling tour. The people running the tour brought us out on a boat to a spot that was good for swimming around in. Before we got into the water, someone asked if there was anything dangerous in the water, and they were like, nah, nothing really dangerous around today. After a while swimming around, we spotted a sea snake, and the woman who was guiding the tour, she's the one who spotted the snake first, was like, oh look, a sea snake, and we swam a little closer, I mean, still probably six or seven meters away, and we watched the snake for a bit, and then it just swam away. There wasn't really any feeling that anyone was in danger, it was just like, hey, look at this cool animal. There are 52 different kinds of sea snake, not too sure what species I saw, but they are all venomous, though some are more venomous than others. It seems that they are also not aggressive and generally want to avoid humans. 
People have died from sea snake bites, but this is usually when they get caught in nets or are stepped on on land or shallow water. They also don't always administer venom, and apparently when they bite, which is rare, only about 3% of the time it is fatal. I will say though, apparently the bites could be painless at first, and then symptoms develop hours later. So if you ever are bitten, you should get medical treatment right away, just in case. And unlike the blue ringed octopus, anti-venom does exist. The next one I'm going to talk about is something I was originally going to put in the weird but completely harmless category, but after looking into it a bit more, maybe it should be here, and that is the sea cucumber. The sea cucumber can expel its external organs if it feels threatened, which sounds sort of gross but not that dangerous. Well, it is a bit dangerous as it can expel something called holothurin, which is a white sticky-like substance that is toxic to humans, and if you get it in your eyes, it can cause permanent blindness. So don't pick up or touch a sea cucumber if you see one, I guess. Now I don't know if that qualifies them for the terrifying monsters of your nightmares. I mean, at least they live in the Mariana Trench, unlike some other things. Do you even go to this school? No. But yeah, maybe not monsters, but just to let you know, you might not want to touch one. Of course lionfish are on a lot of lists. And they do have venomous spines, but again, they usually don't try to attack people. And the stings usually aren't fatal, though they can be very painful. So you probably shouldn't get too close. I think lionfish are a threat in another way though, as I think the real concerning thing about them is that they are an invasive species in many parts of the world. They are, or at least were, popular pets for aquarium owners, but they grow fast and sometimes start eating the other fish in the tank and then people would dump them into the ocean. It seems that this started in the 80s, and then by the 2000s they had spread all along the east coast of the US. They don't have many native predators, especially in places that they have invaded, probably because of their venomous spines. They grow quickly and can lay thousands of eggs every few days, and they eat a lot of reef fish. Fishing competitions have been set up from conservationist groups to try and slow down their population growth. I've also seen divers try to train sharks to eat them, but who knows. Hopefully these efforts will reduce the impact lionfish have on the reef ecosystems. Now, if we are going to talk about venomous fish, we probably have to talk about the reef stonefish, as it's considered the most venomous fish in the world. So, as you can imagine, it has killed people. Again, it's not very common, but it does happen. There was a story I read online about a diving instructor who was stung in Okinawa while barefoot in the water. He stood on one and unfortunately died. It should be noted though that the speed at which he died has led some to think he must have had some underlying conditions. The stonefish doesn't go out looking to attack humans, but it can camouflage pretty well and people accidentally stand on them. It is very rare, but if you are in an area that might have some stonefish, it might be a good idea to wear water shoes and watch where you walk and shuffle your feet a bit as you walk to scare away any hidden fish before you directly stand on one. If you are stung, you're supposed to pour hot but not boiling water on the spot and seek medical attention right away. Okay. The next one on the list is one that makes me pretty uneasy, especially since they are transparent and even a mild touch can seriously hurt you. The thing that really scared me about swimming in Okinawa was the box jellyfish. There are 50 different species, but only a few have venom that can be lethal to humans. It's hard to get an exact number for the amount of people killed annually, as many of the countries where the box jellyfish can be found don't require death certs. But estimates range from dozens to maybe even over 100 people a year, with a lot of these deaths seeming to come from the Philippines. The most venomous species is the Australian box jellyfish, Chironex fleckeri. Apparently they can be found year round, but are more common during the warmer months, so for Australia that would be November to May. And thanks to climate change, the jellyfish season may be starting to increase as the oceans get warmer. It's always the nasty animals that benefit from climate change. But when I went to Okinawa, I wore protective clothing in the water. I think it's called a rash guard. It's basically a full body swimsuit and I also wore water shoes. But if we went to a particular beach and there were signs saying don't swim, box jellyfish sighted today, like this sign I took a picture of, then we didn't risk it. Even with protective clothing, you should always follow the guidelines at the beach. Instead, we went on a glass boat tour and we saw the sea turtle. Sea turtles can eat box jellyfish as the stingers can't penetrate the turtle's skin. Good work. If you do get stung by a box jellyfish, you are supposed to pour vinegar on the area 
contact emergency services and carefully remove the stingers with a towel. Also, if there's a dead one on a beach, it can still sting you, so don't touch it. Now, the next group of animals I'm going to talk about is going to be tricky. Part of me feels like they shouldn't even be on this part of the list. I mean, those creepy jellyfish might kill 100 people a year, shouldn't they be under killers? Well, they definitely should, but it's also venomous and Venn diagram, blah, blah, blah. The next group don't kill very often, but they do kill a few people every year and they come up on lists a lot and they are definitely portrayed as monsters in the media. So let's talk a little bit about sharks. I love sharks. I think they're some of the most majestic, interesting creatures out there. And I think they do get a bad reputation that's not really deserved. So you probably know where I'm going with this, as I've said it before, but it's important so I'm going to keep saying it. Humans are a much greater threat to sharks than sharks are to us. And you know the line, sharks kill a handful of people each year and we kill millions of sharks, somewhere between 70 to 100 million, and that's mostly for shark fin soup. But we are looking at shark attacks on humans, which are rare. Now, like I said earlier, according to the ISAF, any shark over a certain size is a potential threat, which by the way, half of the known 500 or so shark species are less than a meter long. So right off the bat, that rules out like half of all sharks. Out of the ones that are big enough to be dangerous, there are the big three that are considered the most dangerous. They are the great white tiger and bull shark. Great whites attack the most out of the three and tigers have the highest kill ratio. So you can decide from that what you think the most dangerous shark is. Now for practical advice, this shark scientist says the most dangerous shark is the one you're not paying close attention to while you're in the water with it. Now you might be wondering why sharks attack people on rare occasions, and wouldn't you know it, I made a video all about that. But maybe you don't want to watch that. So let me summarize it quickly. Of course, there are multiple different reasons. The shark might be territorial and doesn't want any other large animal around when it's trying to hunt. In some cases, they might just be feeding on humans if they are particularly desperate and hungry, though this probably isn't too common as humans aren't part of their ecosystem and sharks don't really prey on humans. It may have been a mistake. Now I know, I know, the mistaken identity hypothesis may not be as prevalent as previously thought, but considering some attacks happen in murky water and there are videos of sharks rushing at people before breaking away at the last minute, I think it's fair to say that this happens at least sometimes. Even if it's not common, I'm sure some sharks have made some mistakes. There's also curiosity. Sharks feel new things with their mouths like great whites calmly mouthing the sides of cages. There are multiple reasons, though I've gotten comments like, it's simple, sharks are carnivores and humans are made out of meat. Okay, then why do most people who get attacked by sharks not get eaten? And what about all the other reasons? Kinda sounds like you didn't really watch the video. The other thing I wanted to mention briefly about that shark video is that I got a surprising amount of pushback when I said that sharks aren't dangerous. I think there was one comment like, sharks aren't dangerous? Tell that to the men of the USS Indianapolis. Funnily enough, the Indianapolis attacks were actually the first topic I ever planned to make a video about, but I guess I never got around to it for one reason or another. For those of you who don't know, in late July of 1945, the USS Indianapolis, which was a United States Navy heavy cruiser, was sailing towards Guam after delivering components of an atomic bomb to an island in the Pacific. This was going to be the bomb dropped in Hiroshima in August. During the night, it was hit by two torpedoes from a Japanese submarine and the ship sank within 12 minutes. Out of 1,196 crew, about 900 made it into the water alive. Now, apparently the US Navy intercepted a message from the Japanese Navy saying that they had sunk a battleship, but the Navy thought it was just a trick, a trap to lure rescue boats. So it was four days before they were even spotted by a Navy plane. Now, while the men were in the water, some were attacked by sharks, thought to be mostly oceanic white tips and maybe a few tiger sharks. Quint talks about this incident in the movie Jaws. Out of 900 men that went into the water, about 300 came out. And sometimes videos will just tell you that. 900 went in, sharks attacked, 300 came out. This would imply that 600 people were eaten by sharks. Though it should be noted that most people died either from injury, exposure, or dehydration. The estimates on how many people were killed by sharks varies. Many of the sailors were spread out and some groups didn't even see any sharks.
monarchs, but estimates go between a few dozen to over a hundred. But these were very particular circumstances. There were a lot of vibrations and commotions in the water from the ship sinking, as well as a lot of different blood. During the Second World War, sharks like the Oceanic White Tip were feared and implicated in attacks around shipwrecks and plane crashes. This might be one of the reasons why Jacques Cousteau called the Oceanic White Tip the most dangerous of all sharks. Oceanic White Tip certainly can be dangerous, and people should be very cautious around them. But an attack like this isn't the norm these days, and attacks from the big three are more common. Nowadays, people go on diving tours with the oceanic white tips in places like Cat Island in the Bahamas. In the last 20 years or so, there have been about seven unprovoked attacks from oceanic white tips. Five in the Red Sea, one in Hawaii, and one in French Polynesia. Of the seven, two were fatal. I don't want to downplay anyone's death, and of course, people who survive could be left with serious physical, emotional, and mental damage. Here's a charity if you feel like helping out some survivors. All I'm trying to say is, it's very rare to be attacked by a shark. Things aren't as fortunate for the sharks though. In the late 1950s, these sharks were considered some of the most abundant sharks on the planet. Today, however, they are almost all gone. In just 15 years, from 95 to 2010, the population dropped over 90%. I'd like to talk about sharks for hours, but I'll just briefly mention one more thing before we get to the next part of the list. Some people don't like it when I or other people say things like, you're more likely to win the lottery, or be struck by lightning, or, or die falling out of bed, or something like that. I guess the counter argument that people are making is that anyone could get struck by lightning, but you have to be in the water with sharks to be attacked by one. So you should only look at people in the water with sharks to try and come up with a statistic, and not use the full population of a place as it will skew the numbers. If millions of people don't go into the ocean, they shouldn't be included in the data as they aren't relevant. I see where you're coming from. I think the point though is that people do seemingly normal everyday things that have more risk than swimming in the water with sharks. But even with that, if we try to just include people who go swimming in the water, you are still looking at millions of people going into the ocean every year, but only a handful of shark attacks. Now someone might say, no, 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 you have to use people that go into the water where a dangerous shark could potentially be. Well, okay, but sharks have a wide range. Like, let's take a great white shark, the one that attacks the most humans. Okay, here's its range. Obviously, there are particular hotspots and locations that you're a lot more likely to find them, but like... There are a lot of places they could go that might surprise you. For example, the largest preserved specimen of a great white, a 583 centimeter or 19 footer, was caught off the coast of France, and I don't know why it's such a weird shape. I'm not saying any of this to scare anyone, just to make a point. Shark attacks are not common. Next, we'll look at something completely different. Let's talk about hippos. So you probably know hippos are mostly vegetarian. I say mostly, as on rare occasion, they might eat some meat and fish if their diet is a bit deficient, but that's pretty rare. The reason they are dangerous to humans isn't because they want to eat us, but rather that they are extremely territorial. Males can be extra aggressive around mating season, and females are very protective of their calves. But even just in general, hippos are very dangerous, and you shouldn't get close. They not only attack people on the shoreline, but will even attack and capsize boats. There was a case in Nigeria in 2014, where a hippo attacked a boat and killed 13 people, including 12 children, who were trying to cross the river to get to school. Though hippos may be a little more docile on land, they can still outrun most humans. You can find hippos in sub-Saharan Africa, and I guess Colombia if you count the descendants of Pablo Escobar's pets. There are no official reports on how many people are killed by hippos every year, but estimates range from 500 to 3,000. So you should just avoid hippos. Next on our list, let's take a look at some crocodilians. That would include actual crocodiles, of course, garials and false garials, and alligators and caimans. Since it has been mentioned a few times, let's start with the black caiman of South America. Found in the Amazon basin, the black caiman can grow quite large, about 5 meters, 16 feet, with some reports saying it can get up to 6 meters, or 20 feet. Again, there isn't much concrete data on the exact number of attacks, but it seems attacks are rare and usually happen to fishermen who enter the water to retrieve their nets. It is thought that black caimans are provoked by people getting too close to their nets. The American crocodile, which lives from South Florida to the coast of Mexico to Peru and Venezuela, is also reasonably big, 2.9 to 4.1 meters, but again reports say males can grow to over 6 meters or 20 feet. Luckily, this seems to also be a very shy crocodile. Even though they occasionally attack, they prefer to stay away from humans. 
It seems to be a similar story with the American alligator found in southeastern United States. They certainly can and have attacked and killed people, but it doesn't happen very often. It also seems that in many of the cases, the attacks happened on people who are handling the alligators. So far for the crocodilians, you could almost put them onto the potentially dangerous but not really that dangerous list, I guess. Venn diagram, whatever. And I guess we should put the gharial and false gharial somewhere in between there too. The next three species are considered the three most dangerous species of crocodile. The mugger crocodile of Iran and the Indian subcontinent is also considered to be a dangerous animal that grows to about 5 meters and kills about 18 people a year and according to some sources is the third most dangerous crocodile. Though attacks are rare even with many humans and mugger crocodiles living close to each other. For example in India's western state of Gujarat many people live close by these crocodiles and most of the time both humans and crocodiles just leave each other alone. Next we have saltwater crocodiles and they can get very large. Males are thought to be able to grow over 7 meters, 23 feet. There are even some reports of some getting much bigger than that in the past. They aren't just the largest crocodiles but the largest reptiles in the world. And yes, I know some snakes are supposed to get longer but in terms of overall mass, saltwater crocodiles are the biggest reptiles. Even with that, they usually don't like being around humans though they are more likely to see a human as a potential meal. I was a little little surprised that the amount of attacks from saltwater crocodiles in Australia about two attacks a year. This may be due to good wildlife management and educating people about areas where the crocodiles are. Of course this crocodile isn't just native to northern Australia but also the east coast of India and across southeast Asia. In 2021 there were six fatal attacks in eastern India from saltwater crocodiles. Though getting exact numbers overall is kind of difficult. According to a paper from 2012 called a preliminary analysis of worldwide crocodilian attacks. They said, This species is responsible for considerably more attacks on humans than previously believed, likely due to the majority of attacks being reported in different languages or only to local media. I guess this is the reason why the saltwater crocodile is often considered the second deadliest crocodile on earth. And the first? Well, it's the Nile crocodile. Again, as I've said with all the others, estimates on number of fatalities vary. The higher range goes up to about a thousand deaths per year, while other estimates are in the hundreds. There was even an infamous case of a single Nile crocodile from Burundi named Gustave that may have killed hundreds of people, but you can make an entire video it seems that the reason the Nile crocodile is considered more dangerous than the saltwater crocodile isn't necessarily because it's more aggressive, but rather that it lives in closer proximity to humans. It's found in 26 countries throughout Africa, and it's also rather large, getting close to the size of a salty, capable of reaching a length over 6 meters and weighing over a thousand kilos. And yes, there are reports of them getting even bigger than that. This seems to be a trend with crocodiles. Like I said, it's a bit tricky to get reports that cover all 26 countries where the Nile crocodiles are found, but research done on Nile crocodile attacks in South Africa found that about 65% of bite victims were male, and they also found that about 51% of victims were between the ages of 0 to 15. It also found that people were, quote, most commonly bitten when they were swimming or bathing. Many were bitten when they were fishing. There is a bit of a debate as to which animal is more dangerous, a Nile crocodile or a hippo. Of course, many more people die from mosquito and snake bites, but of the two, it's hard to say which one is more dangerous since a lot of attack numbers are based on estimates. Whichever you think, I'd say the bottom line is they are both very dangerous animals to be around, so don't go near any area that has either of them. Well that sounds good, but a lot of people don't really have a choice, like those kids who are just trying to get to school. Many people need to rely on different rivers and lakes and bodies of water for a variety of things. Drinking water, bathing, doing laundry, fishing, transport. So for people who are in those situations, me saying, just stay away from the river isn't always an option. Now people do do things to try and reduce attacks. In remote areas of Tanzania, construction of new bridges help to reduce conflict for those who need to cross rivers. And people do create barriers in the water to reduce the chance of an attack. And sometimes authorities try to move problem crocs, but these solutions don't always work for every problem. Hopefully as time goes on, people will figure out new methods and new ways of reducing attacks and the number of fatalities from these animals will drop as time goes on. I hope. So, how do you end a weird mess list Venn diagram video thing like this? 
You know, I really didn't want to make a video vilifying any animal, but if we're being honest, there are places and animals in this world that are dangerous. Some animals definitely can hurt you, and maybe, depending on your situation, some animals can even be seen as a monster. But, you know, a lot of other animals aren't really as dangerous as they seem. I mean, look, water monster lists can be fun to watch. Sometimes it's even fun to watch the speculative ones about what could be down there. But you know what else is fun? Going into the ocean. On the few occasions I've been privileged enough to see different ecosystems under the water, it has been nothing short of fascinating. And I know I've barely scratched the surface. There's a lot of ocean out there. Like, a lot, a lot. And I know that can seem sort of frightening, but isn't it also exciting? So much is just under the surface, waiting to be seen and explored. There is a quote I really like about the ocean by Dave Barry that goes like this. There's nothing wrong with enjoying looking at the surface of the ocean itself. Except that when you finally see what goes on underwater, you realize that you've been missing the whole point of the ocean. Staying on the surface all the time is like going to the circus and staring at the outside tent. I mean, you obviously want to be safe about how you do it. You can always look up and research any place you plan to get into the water, be it an ocean or a lake or a river, and follow any recommended precautions. You could always try and do a guided tour with a professional if you want to get into some deeper water. Of course, we have to respect nature, but I also think we should enjoy it. Even if you don't want to get into the water, there are other ways of peeking below the surface, of seeing what's down there. And if you ever get the chance to do so, I don't think you'll be disappointed. Thanks for watching.